love for the Father. Uh, thankful for that very special item of music. And most of all, I'm thankful that we are here. Amen. 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 I thank God that Brother O'Shea is here. Amen. And uh, when he did the children's story, <laughs> my very best friend, Brother Archer, said, Elder, you know what happened there? I said, God is good. God is good. All the time. And uh, the Spirit of God is not part of confusion. No. Amen? <laughs> it is a mystery sometimes Amen. how sometimes something looks like accident. Mm -hmm. But you rest and assure God's purpose is being you know, works out. Amen. Father, we thank you for your mercies. And we thankful that you have given us the Bible. Yes. This manual that will keep us in shape spiritually and physically, right. mentally and socially as we prepare to go to heaven in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I feel uh, privileged this morning to continue a discourse Amen. entitled, you know, under the subject headed from the previous uh, presentation. Remember that was Dragon versus the King. And today, the part of the no retreat, mm -hmm. no surrender part two. That's right. Amen. Want us to understand the context in which we live in this world today. Amen. And uh, just like the previous presentation, this present presentation is rooted in the same text, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Let us go to that. And read that together. I know we are for very well familiar with it, but this Bible is given to us for the purpose of reading. Yes. Memorization has its place too. Amen? Amen. And the word says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed. And her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Amen. Amen. I said then, as I as I will say today, Genesis 3:15 is a declaration of war. Amen. Amen. Satan understood. What God was saying to him. And he wasted no time in carrying the attack, in responding with a murderous scheme. Since it is in his mind that the seed of the woman will deal with him, he decided and formulated a plan to hurt the seed of the woman at an early stage. Huh. Satan's plan was clearly an attempt. Who he can't kill, he will keep in his power as captives. If I can't kill them, I will keep them in captivity. And so the first child that was born to Adam and Eve, he didn't kill him. He had him captive. The book in the scripture says, you know, that ye are of your father, the devil. 
Whoever the devil has in captivity, think and work on behalf of the devil. Cain was kept in the devil's captivity. Huh. And what did Cain do? He understood that Abel was a true and faithful follower of God. So since he wouldn't come, he also killed the second seed. Capture one, kill the other. Get the picture here. This is the reality of the world today, you know. Amen. All right. We are living in a state of war. Those who are enslaved by the devil are his children. Counted as his seed. His seed. And they will do his bidding even to commit murder. Now you see in today, right today, how people are disposed and inclined to kill Christians. And this is, as I said the last time, this is just the beginning of trouble. For a brief period, now watch this now, for a brief period, there was no seed forthcoming and the devil had a happy day. Get the picture what I'm saying? Since he had captured the son, the first son of Adam and Eve, and he had killed the one that was faithful, then there's no faithful seed here to continue. Satan have a happy time. Yes. Yes. But God, in his wisdom, had banished, put into exile, Satan's seed. And praise God, as God would have it, Eve conceived again. And this time she have another son, Seth, Genesis 4.25. And as described by the mother, that this is the seed given to me by God to replace the one that was killed. Seth was placed under God's special protection. And so, so it was that his seeds, his seed continue to be faithful. As you know, the, the, the genealogy from Seth coming right through to Noah. Mm -hmm. But something again happened. I said, the devil recognized. Amen. Okay. Since, yes, something happened with the succeeding generations. Realize I am around in the next 16 to 1700 years. Satan took over again. Now, what's going on here now? The human race, we came to the place. Where in this warfare, the whole and entire world was corrupted. Satan carried out his campaign strategically and corrupted the entire population. The word of God says that one man, now listen actually what is coming on here. We, are at the, we were at the point of total obliteration. But God will come for one man. Who? found grace Amen. in the sight of God. Amen. This is how this warfare is brutal. Now when you look at it, one would say, Satan has won. 
But with God, even one man is a mighty army. And we can take on the world. Now, and so it was the devil ambition throughout the ages of the history of the earth to continue this conflict in both and in every level and especially we find in the spiritual and in the military realm today you see all these high-ranking military officers and politicians the bible has warned us don't trust the words of the people with ranks anymore whether they're congressmen and whatever representation they give you politically up there because what why their spiritual wickedness going on in high places for God's chosen people there is a deliverance in spite of what we go through the plan of the devil is to kill and enslave and maim every time God's people sink into a situation that seems hopeless God come true with a plan to free us look down through the ages just to name a few the children of Israel in Egypt hard labor we just read and it looks like just an easy you know let me tell you something slavery there's nothing dignifying or easy with it we have sabbath day today to keep they were working how long seven days a week in the mud pit making bricks for the egyptian kingdom very little to eat and it's harder than that but what Satan recognized that these were the children of Abraham. And as I told you before, if he can't claim you, if he can't kill you, he's going to maim you in captivity. But God delivered them. Amen? Amen. Thank God that he delivered them. But what happened? I'll tell you something. This is the thing that surprised me. Even in the liberation, they were still glorifying slavery. You couldn't get it out of them. Hmm? <clears throat> they were still talking that it was better to go back into slavery than to live in the freedom that God had given them. And what was worse, even one of the liberators in Aaron himself got caught up in this idolatrous behavior think about it even one of the liberators this is how bad the devil is you know <laughs> brethren the frequency of war in the land of promise when we look at the children of Israel's experience God brought them into this land that was supposed to be flowing with milk and honey. But instead, because of the devil outworking to ensure that they did not enjoy this promise, they were led into idolatry, adultery, all form of sin. As a result, God could not pour out the blessing the way he desired to keep them. 
And the devil was ha very happy about this. You know something? That is why when we misbehave, it's a happy time for the devil. Because he wants us on his side. What is going on here today is sadness for the devil. Because this is not hopeful to him. He remember, look how many folks are here today. One man hinder my plan. This is too much people in here today. Who is serving the living God. Amen. And I thank God that you are here. The devil ensured that Israel was not going to enjoy the promises of God. And as a, as a situation arose with them in the land of promise, brethren, the neighbors of Israel give them a hard time when they came into the land. They had warlike neighbors. They had on the east, the Mesopotamians. On the southeast, they had the Moabites. On the east, they had the Midianites and the Ammonites. And on the southwest, they had the Philistines, the worst enemy. Philistines, at that time, the Philistines were the worst enemy. And it was during the reign of the first king of Israel, King Saul, that the, the nation of Israel came under a severe threat. Huh, Lord of mercy. As a matter of fact, the Philistines invaded the ter territory of Judah. Massive army. It was their intention to put the nation of Israel in subjection of slavery. Now we pick up the story. Brother Oshie. 1 Samuel chapter 17. In the book of 1 chap chapter Samuel 17, it describes The situation. The Philistines called out Israel to battle. And on that setting, there were two mountains. The army of the Philistines were on one and the army of Israel on the other side. These are not the days of ballistic missiles. You know what I'm saying? And drones. And these are the days when, when kings, you had to lead your nation into battle. Not like today, presidents stay home and send the armies. You have to lead your nation. Prove your worth as a champion. And so armies would face each other before actual engaging in actual action of warfare. We know the story that they sent out their champions. And he's there parading. Great champion inviting Israel to send a man listen carefully to fight with me and if I defeat him listen to him now he says you will be our servants and if your champion takes me down and defeat me we will be a servant but when they look at the size of this man, this man is 10 feet tall. And I will tell you something, if you see a 10 feet man coming here, it's <laughs> a giant at that, not just a little fine puny man, a giant. 
I'm telling you, it's going to cause some reverberation in here. When Goliath sent out his challenge, the Bible says he drove fear into the children of Israel, even the king. And he's there masquerading 40 days and 40 nights. Israel can't find a man. You look around, everybody, not me. You go, not me. So Jesse, you know, everybody know that Israel is out there, but the, the nation is not hearing any result of, they know the army gone out there to fight. What is happening? Jesse said, Joseph, uh, sorry, David, I want you to take some supplies to your three brothers that are out there. And at the same time, when I look back at the story, you know, I learned something there. Take some cheese to the commander of the unit that your brothers are in. You see, when the nation goes to war, sometimes it, the civilians will send food to sustain the army out there in battle. <laughs> so the father didn't only send provision for his sons, but he sent provision so that that could share among the others. And so David heard about this this giant. Poor thing, he didn't even know, understand. So he has to ask what is going on. And he got the story. So he said, so what happened? Nobody can go out there? I can take this man on. <laughs> you? So, and he was speaking so positively. Word got back to Saul. Now listen, we got a man who's ready to go there. But when David appeared before Saul, it's just a lad. Don't understand the power of children, you know. When you're here to say something, you sometimes listen. And there's power in the youth. Amen? Now listen. Saul was got through relief, but this was too young. This boy was too young. But David said, listen. I can take this giant on. And he said, you know why I can take him on? You see, when we look at the story, in the Bible, in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, we will see that Samuel anointed David as the future king of Israel. This story got a lot of things coming through. Amen. I want you to listen to me carefully. And so David was already anointed as the future king of Israel. Get me now. And the Bible says that when David received the anointing that the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Amen. Get this, listen, get this thing going. When David stood before Saul, he was speaking with the power yes. of the spirit. Amen. No, he wasn't boastful. He was just assertive. Yes. You know, Saul armor couldn't work for him, right? Because when he put it on and he step off, he cannot stand properly. So when folks see he's taking it off, you say, this guy ain't ready. 
but he's not ready with what they have. Amen? So Saul said, well, what's going to happen now? David said, listen. Oh, by the way, he told Saul, he said, let me tell you, Saul, dear king. He said, I, I am a shepherd. A bear came. And a lion came. To take my sheep. And by this power of God. I went after them. And I slew, slew them. And took my sheep back. This is a bad young man. This is, this is credential I need to listen to. So he says, okay. And he stepped out. David stepped out to meet the lion. Now watch this part now. Because we're going to come back to this later, you know. He bent down. And he picked up five stones from the brook you see there were stones all around but he took stones from the brook now stones in running water yes oh yes oh yes amen listen is more in the matter we say home than the person. He took stones that are under water. Yes. Sanctified stones. Yes. The Bible says, listen to the words that he chose five stones. These stones, stones in water are smooth stones. They got the polish on them. David understood the aerodynamics of a smooth stone. Let me tell you something. That day, Goliath didn't know what he was up against, you know. Some science in this thing here now. And what Goliath was looking at he saw the stick in the lad's hand. Remember David went to the shepherd's staff, right? And so he advanced. So Goliath has an armor bearer that carries a shield. And he said, the armor bearer, step aside. This is, this is a little boy. He said, this is total disrespect. Totally disrespectful. Yes. Said, am I a dog that you send this little boy to, to confront me? Saul, this is all you can do. And he cursed the God of Israel. David came up against Goliath. He said, this day the Lord deliver thee into my hands and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee and I will give the carcass of the host, to the host of the Philistine this day unto the folds of the ear. Yeah. How is this little boy talking? So David at this time start a little tr trot. You know, a little trot towards him. Throw the, throw the staff aside, push his hand in the back, take out one stone. And let me tell you something. I saw a program where they tried to see how effective David slow stone was to kill a man. Honestly, I saw that program. So they, they got somebody who was skillful in using a sling and they set up a, a pumpkin and a melon at a certain distance to represent a man's head 
to see if there's really truth in getting the accuracy. And they average the distance that David might have been in confronting the giant. Yes. Let me tell you. That stone, when it leaves the sling, travels at a hundred kilometers per second. You see, the earth is swinging this stone and, and releasing it. It was like a bullet, a missile. You, you can't even see it coming. When it is released by a person who knows how to use the sling. And David was a skillful user of the sling. So, for when the place started and he got up and he started to swing that thing, all the night knew lights went out. Lights out. The stone crushed into his head. All right. Brethren, This, when we look at this story at first, many of us know it as David, David killed Goliath. But there's, there is something in this story that is deep. Well, the first thing, the other thing I want to tell us is that you see when David defeated Goliath, it wasn't just this boy alone. It was divine empowerment. Yes. Amen. Amen. Right? Yes. Oh, yes. That delivered that crushing blow yes. to the head of Goliath. Yes. Now, upon closer examination of this baby color count of David versus Goliath, let us don't forget Genesis 3 Chapter 15. Amen. The killing of Goliath. Now, first of all, let me say this. God gave the prophecy back then. But this story was a reminder to the devil that you see this harassment that you are carrying out on my people. I'm going to remind you what is going to happen to you in the future. It is not an ordinary story. Amen. The killing of Goliath, therefore, is an enactment and it's a prelude to the events that is prophesied in Genesis 3.15, which happened at what happened at Calvary and what will happen at the end of the millennium. After we spend time in heaven. The thing is. God was giving his people. Reassurance. How was David. A foreshadow of Christ. That's a question you can ask me. How was David. A foreshadow of Christ. Representing Christ. As the slayer. Of this great enemy of mankind. Point number one. Now you will, you may have to write a few things as we go along, because we we won't have the time to go into all the scripture. <laughs> David and Jesus were born in the same tongue of Bethlehem and Frater. Micah five two and First Samuel seventeen twelve. They were coming from the same place of birth. You get where I'm going at? All right. The seed promised by God, who will slay the great enemy of his people, is an anointed king. Amen. Come on, church. Yeah. Our Messiah. 
is the anointed one. Amen. David was anointed king of Israel before his encounter with Goliath. 1 Samuel 16, 13. The spirit of God was upon Jesus before he started his ministry. When he went to the temple, he said that the what? The spirit of the Lord, what? Is upon me to preach and to, and to do what? Most of all. Oh man, come on church. What is that? To set what? You see what's going on here? Watch the roles, you know. Watch the roles. For some, that's 4 Samuel 16, 13. And Luke 4, 18, 21. Bring those two together. Now, David was this anointed one, the anointed one, is sent by his father to the king. David is sent by his father to the king, to King Saul. When King Saul sent for him to come to pray, you remember David went to pray music for Saul when he was molested by that spirit, that evil spirit. Watch this now. In 1 Samuel 16, 20, David the anointed one is sent by his who? Father Jesse to King Saul. Watch this now. 1 Samuel 16, 20. All right, get it. 1 Samuel 16, 20. See if you get that. Let's read it together. See if you get that. Is it from? Okay. Here is David. The anointed one, you know, was sent with his father, by his father. Come on, what, what it says? Now watch the gifts. He went on an ass. Amen. When Jesus Amen. was on his last leg of his journey to, to Jerusalem, he went to Jerusalem riding what? Come on, church. Right in there. And Jesus, bread represents who? No, no, let's get back. Let's go back again to him. Hold on, hold on. Jesus, before his crucifixion, went to Jerusalem riding on an ass. We got that? When he was at Jerusalem, they had what? Communion service. He said, this is what? My body. Right? Which is? Which is what? Broken for you. Then the wine. Representing the blood. And the kid. Huh? You got it, church? You know what happened? When you get it, I want to hear that it pinch you and you say amen. amen. Like when somebody pinch you, you say, what you tell them? Man, what you doing? Isn't that what you tell them? What you doing? So when you get it, I would like to hear you say amen. 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 So these gifts that David was bearing sent by his father, Jesus Christ sent by his father, Hmm? Represented what? The bread of life. Amen. The wine, the blood, the sacrifice. Yes. And even the kid. Hmm? You see what's going on here? That's first Samuel 16, 20. Goliath's threat was not confined to Israel army alone, but the entire Hebrew kingdom. Causing fear from king to the common citizen. Later events in this life here that Christ came to deliver, deliver us from. When you talk about a time of trouble, 
for God's people. Mm -mm -mm. We will need to depend and lean on the arms of Jesus. Amen. Goliath ranted and challenged the Israel army for 40 days and 40 nights. David had to put an end to it. Jesus Christ, when he was baptized, he was led into the wilderness. Remember I said, I want somebody represent Christ, somebody represent the devil. The Bible said he was led into the wilderness to be what? To be tempted of the 40 days and 40 nights. And Jesus, at the end of that, didn't he put an end to that? Oh, yes. Amen. This is a wonderful story. Amen. Now, when we read the story, let us understand that in this encounter, first of all, let us zero in. As a matter of fact, I have a brother here today, a brother, not, not a, you know, and he said to me, well, Elder, I can't understand how a stone could stick in a man for it. That thing baffling me. I said, all right, we will deal with that. All right? Okay. David, the Bible says in for Samuel 17, 40. And he took his staff in his hand and chose. Now, he just, the Bible doesn't say he just picked up. He selected five stones. Five smooth stones. And you know something? Stone and rock are used interchangeably in the Bible to represent Jesus. The rock of ages, the cornerstone, all right, stone and rock. And nowhere, nowhere is stone more prominent than in the book of Daniel, chapter 2. In Daniel, chapter 2, we see the stone. Watch this now. A stone that is what? Not, that is not cut out with what? A hand of man, not from any quarry. What's going on? Stone. When David selected a stone, it was nature's doing from the hand of God. Watch the stone. All right, so the stone represents Christ. From studying Genesis 3.15, it is determined that the devil bruised Jesus at Calvary. Jesus is presented to us as what the cornerstone, right? All right. So who wounded the stone on the cross of Calvary? Come on, church. The devil, right? Come on, give me an amen. The devil, right? Hurt the stone on Calvary. Now, every, sometimes we wonder, when I was preparing this little discourse, I'm praying and I'm asking God, I said, Lord, why five stones? The morning, morning, why? And I'm going through the day. And then a voice says, you know, look back at Calvary. And I see five wounds. Some people said the stone were representing the five cities of the Philistines. No, 
stoning has to do with Philistine city. No. Stone has to do with Jesus. This is a victorious stone. This wounded stone. Now, so these five stones represented Christ and what he suffered at Calvary. And I'll show you something just now. And because you see the stone now represents even the seed that delivered a blow to Goliath's head. And because it was going to be a comprehensive victory, it stuck in its forehead. It is not a knock and move, it's a knock and stay. When God does something come true, it, it happens differently. It was the power of God that caused the stone to stick in the lion's forehead. It represented Christ. The devil, brothers, watch this now. Who was present at that conflict? Shudder. Shudder to see what happened to Goliath. Because it reminded him what lies ahead for him. The Bible says in Genesis 3.15, he's going to deal with your head. So what did David do after he cracked his skull? He cut his head off. Now, the devil also represents snake, right? Don't forget that. How do you kill a snake? I tell you, we got terrible snakes in Guyana. And we got one, a familiar one, that's named La Barrio. Our sister Norma, one lady killed her. She has a testimony. I went to see her at the hospital, she didn't even know. Her, her legs swell up big, like I don't they could swell no more. And when they kill the laboria, they don't just lash it on its back. Brother Pumal, you know what I'm talking about. They have to take the head off. Because you hit it, it lie there. Somebody pass, they're going to get bite. Yes. So bad it is. Yes. David, I oh my gosh, after, after he hit the man, the man fell out. Wait, why would he have to still cut off the head? Because he's dealing with the serpent. Yes. You have to take the head off. Satan cringe. From that time that David killed Goliath, you know another thing what I discovered when I study this, this, uh, message I realize from the time David was killed uh, sorry from the time Goliath was killed to the time at the end of the millennium we will be in the fifth millennium you didn't get that one brethren now you see what I'm saying God got a way God has worked things out I don't know but God got a way that Sometimes, you know, the mysteries as you study it, I said, this Bible is a deep well. You hear what I'm saying? This Bible is a deep well. So when I look something, just said, look at this thing. When I looked at it, it is like we are in the fifth millennium. At the end of that 1,000 year, you will be in the fifth millennium. When God will himself will put the devil and his angels and death in the fiery place called hell. Okay. Now I need to, I need to you know, folks, say, if my wife was sitting there, she'd look at me and I would, I'd say, she's not here, but I'm still coming down to, I close, all right? 
And I've got to start putting my landing gears on. All right? You know, close calls in history are inspired by the devil. But he didn't inspire them as close calls. He inspired them in the same context of the controversy. No retreat, no surrender. I tell you, brethren, the Bible says that God will have to cut short the time for us. Because if he doesn't do that, some of us will lose faith when we see the devil start to perform. Now let me tell you something. In the course of history, I'm going to tell you some near things that nearly happened to civilization. Just about three examples in short. In the year 732 AD, the Muslims invaded East, Western Europe start a conquest on the Tariq. And the Moors were so vicious and skillful in warfare, nobody could stop them. They spread like locusts. They knocked out Spain, Portugal. France was the next country. And so the Moors, they gather up in France. Just as how the Philistines, look at it, you know, just as how the Philistines and the Israel army stood off. Christians and Muslims. And they were there for one week looking at each other. And finally the war break, as we say war break. Hmm. General Borta, all right, uh, he, um, Charles Martel, sorry, Charles Martel, Charles Martel, the general of the French army, he led the French army and defeated the Moors. What is the point? This is the point. Historians said that if the Muslim had defeated the French army, there was no other army in Western Europe to stop the advance. What's the point again still of that? Anywhere that the Muslim conquered, they had to accept Islam. Now you watch good what I'm trying to tell you now. If you didn't accept it, you were killed. I said before there was no army to stop them. All right. The people who came to colonize America and start America, if they truly did come from Europe after that, what religion they would have brought here? You see, this is the thing. God works in mysterious ways to develop, to, to, to destroy and to derail the plans of the devil. This gospel has to be preached. Adolf Hitler, he had the power and the might. Don't, don't get wrong, don't get me wrong. Hitler had the power and the might to conquer the world. But somehow, things went awry. What do you think happened here? God had to step in. Now let me show you another thing. Christians in Europe, and in England in particular, when they saw the advance, meant of Hitler. They cringe. And look how we think I'm home to Adventist now. The editor of the Signs of the Times, Arthur Maxwell, writing at the time in England, 
His students told him, he was the editor of the Science of the Times. His students told him, you know what? Stop writing editorials about the fall of Hitler because we are going to lose this war and your life will be online. Maxwell responded by writing a, an article dedicating the next signs of the times of July 1940, if you can get a copy anywhere, July 1940, and dedicate it, based it on Daniel chapter 2. You hear what I'm saying to you? He based it on Daniel chapter 2. We Adventists, we got things and we don't know what we have. He said this prophecy can't fail. Maxwell responded and wrote this editorial. And he told the brethren, he says, keep your copy. Challenge them, keep your copy. Daniel chapter 2 can't fail. And one of the best, uh, his reasons for saying this, he based it on two words to also found. He said, there's no other prophecy in the Bible that carries these two words. In John chapter 2, verse 45, it says that it is certain and it is sure. Amen. You hear what I'm saying here? He said, this prophecy is certain and sure. Let me tell you, just to remind you, for those who may have forgotten, in Daniel chapter 2, the stone that is cut out without hands slammed in to the feet of the image of Nebuchadnezzar. And listen to that. Look at it now. This stone in that one head. Church used to say amen. This stone wiped out the entire army of the enemies of God. And sets up the kingdom of God. This stone is a sure stone. This stone is a certain stone. Yes. Yes. Brethren, yes, may God help us yes. and thank Jesus yes. that who is the rock of ages? Yes. Who is our shepherd? Yes. You know something? You can feel safe and feel sure. I remember this old Anglican name. Loving shepherd of thy sheep Oh, keep thy lamb in safety, keep. Right? And what else? Nothing can thy power withstand. Who can pluck me from thy hand? May God bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Alan? Amen. All right, then. Yeah.